Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is a chart that we looked at just a little while ago, and this is the stock chart of First Majestic Silver. That's the candlesticks, and the line chart is the price of silver. So you can see that we, we had this kind of reversal gap, little tiny gap maybe, in the price of First Majestic, and uh, you know it was a big gap that got filled, and maybe it left some. But th those are important. Uh, anytime there's a runaway gap on the chart, you got to watch those carefully because that means there's actually a price uh, that the stock didn't trade. And it, it, it really always wants to trade at every price it has never traded. Just That has to do with the nature of stops, uh, uh, both buy stops, sell stops, and protective stop loss orders and all of the stops that are put at certain prices. Markets are tend to draw towards stops. So a market that doesn't draw towards the stops and leaves a hole is, is a sign of a very strong trend. Now this is a phenomenal difference here. You can see that the price of silver at uh, where we're at 1724, uh, for it to catch up to the price of First Majestic on a relative basis for the last three years, uh, we'd have to be trading at $26 silver. That is fascinating because we know that $26 silver is actually the bottom of the next major resistance point, which is right about in here. So there it is, even on the weekly chart, big, big difference. First Majestic just absolutely taking off um, and uh, silver being left behind. Certainly unprecedented on this chart. We don't really have anything like it. Uh, we have silver taking off here back in 2010 and then first Majestic catching up. Uh, but we don't really have, uh, except for maybe here, which was kind of a fake out. So we're going to keep an eye on this one. These two are probably going to approach each other. Uh, something's going to give. Now the stock market was very, very weak today. Let's actually go ahead and pull that up because... Uh, we went and touched those highs near 18,000 instead of the industrials though. Let's go ahead and pull up the transports. I like the transports better. They seem to be a better leading indicator. So on the transports, we seem to have a rolling over pattern going on and it's kind of a dead cat bounce, uh, definitely forming a kind of a top here. Uh, the transports did not rally back into new highs as opposed to, say, the Dow 30, let's do an over, overlay of the industrials of the transports. And so you can see that the, the industrials didn't make a new high either, but came very, very close, whereas the transports just kind of uh, had a dead cat bounce and are rolling over again. Fascinating stuff. So let's uh, look at a couple stories here. The first one is uh, about Donald Trump and the the more I read David Stockman the more I like him this issue that Trump is poking at this issue about the debt it's fascinating to see the panic that is caused by Trump starting to talk about the real issues because everyone knows that it, the whole thing is a gigantic house of cards that they're uh, they've got you know, a hundred plates spinning on poles, running around trying to keep them all spinning and, uh, you know, not have them all start collapsing at the same time. So let's read this. This is, again, David Stockman. You have to love it when one of Donald Trump's wild pitches sends the Beltway hypocrites into high dudgeon, but his rumination about negotiating a discount on federal debt was priceless. No sooner did the unschooled Trump mention out loud what is already the official policy of the U.S. government than a beltway chorus of fiscal house wreckers commenced screaming like banshees about the sanctity of Uncle Sam's credit promises. Let's see. For 89 months now, the Federal Reserve has pounded interest rates to the zero bound because come hell or high water, the U.S. economy must have 2% inflation in order to grow and prosper. Other than a handful of rubes from the congressional hinterlands, there is nary a Washington operative from either party who has questioned the appropriateness or effectiveness, let alone the sanity of the Bernanke Yellen 2% inflation totem. 
That means, of course, exactly 30 years from today, investors would get back 54.5 cents on an inflation-adjusted money per dollar of principal on a 30-year Treasury bond if the Fed hits sacred targets. If that's not default, it's certainly a deeper discount than even Donald had in mind when jabbering to CNBC about his years as the king of debt. Oh yes, the monetary geniuses who peddle the 2% inflation gospel claim we are all in it together, that is prices, wages, profits, and rents, and even indexed social benefits allegedly all march upwards at 2% per year, and save for minor leads and lags in timing, no one is financially worse for the wear. Come on, that's rank poppycock. The truth is, savers get killed and borrowers get windfalls. The wages of upper-end workers keep up, while the purchasing power of paychecks lower down the ladder shrinks continuously. Social Security recipients get recompense. Private pensioners get shafted. Yada, yada. Moreover, the biggest windfall harvesters of the Fed's deliberate debt default policy are the leveraged gamblers of Wall Street and the clueless debt-addicted politicians of Washington. Even if you grant that the latter have no inkling that the savings function is the key to capitalist prosperity, they do spend a goodly amount of time waxing about their endless affections for America's working people. Why Governor Kasich never finished a single GOP primary debate without claiming he understood how to improve the U.S. economy because his father was a mailman. So take a look at the graph below on real wages since the Fed went full tilt with the printing press in 2007, this is not a picture of 2% lockstep. Less educated and lower wage workers have experienced shrinking real wages and for a self-evident reason. On the margin, they are more exposed to the lower nominal wages of foreign goods and services competitors than our workers on the upper end of the jobs and income ladder. And of course, that's becoming more and more so government workers and those who are in protected industries, things like medicine, although those are starting to deflate as well. The closer it is to government, the higher the wages. And of course, when it goes bust, they're going to be the people rioting. In the 2% inflation campaign is the re- in the real world is the very opposite of the Keynesian lockstep claim. Its incidence among economic agents and classes is actually capricious and inequitable in the extreme. In fact, It is a grand policy scheme of random monetary default, but since the Donald had the temerity to broach the topic, whether by inadvertence or by purpose, the spendthrifts of the imperial city are now scrambling to smother us in a verbal blanket of phony fiscal rectitude. In this regard, there are a few more noxious precincts of status fiscal hypocrisy than the occupied ranks of scribblers and bloviators at Politico. By the lights of these folks, everything that has been done in the Imperial City these last several decades should have been done. Certainly, there is no fiscal crisis that might warrant radical ideas like those proffered by Trump. Why Obama, the Fed, and Congress actually saved the country from Great Depression 2.0 in 2008-2009. Since then, in fact, we have been marching resolutely toward economic recovery and fiscal stabilization. No, not even close. There's been no meaningful economic recovery, and the fiscal condition of the nation is frightful. As to the former, there are few, still fewer full-time, full-pay breadwinner jobs than before the crisis. Likewise, the median household's real income is still far lower than when the previous Clinton was shuffling out of the White House in January 2001. And there's the chart. And he goes on, and it's excellent. Uh, he makes so many points here that... Uh, The current administration is just trying to uh, limp their way out of this mess. I am still shocked. I did not think that Obama was going to make eight years without having this thing collapse on his watch. And so I've been wrong. I have to admit that I was wrong. I had no idea that they could kick the, the can this far down the road. But you have to remember that these people are utterly corrupt. They are completely compromised in every way. Uh, they, they're, these people are blackmailed. Uh, they, they're controlled. And uh, you know, we, just, we don't even have any idea how far the evil goes. And I'm, I'm going to show you an example of this. 
This is another story from Zero Hedge. Admittedly, that this story probably was leaked by the Clinton campaign. Wouldn't surprise me at all uh, because it's very damaging to Bernie Sanders. But it's absolutely fascinating. And, and Zero Hedge, it, it, if it weren't for the commenters on Zero Hedge, we wouldn't know uh, the full impact of this. But because of some hints that were given from the comments, I was able to chase this thing down. And it is a shocking story. So you can see here, here's Bernie Sanders and his wife, and she was the president of this Burlington College, which is now closing due to crushing debt under her presidency. So let's read, in what may or may not be a harbinger of things to come should Bernie Sanders become president, earlier today, Burlington College, a small Vermont private school once led by the wife of Democrat presidential candidate Bernie Sanders, said Monday it will close later this month, citing, quote, the crushing weight of debt incurred during the presidency of Jane Sanders, who was in charge of the college until 2011. According to WAPO, the college, which enrolled 224 students as of the fall of 2014, said it faced financial troubles connected with its 2010 purchase of 32 acres of lakefront property from the Archdiocese of Burlington. Keep that in mind. According to the Burlington Free Press, the college said it had sold the property to reduce its debt to a manageable level, but it was placed on probation in 2014 by its accrediting agency and faced cash flow problems due to the imminent loss of a line of credit. Now, the price they paid was $10 million, and keep that one in mind. The reason for the small liberal school's terminal financial trouble is that to fund the property purchase from the Catholic diocese, Sanders took out $10 million in loans. As Heat Street reported last month, the college almost immediately fell short on its financial obligations as fundraising pledges and commitments Ms. Sanders cited in the loan agreements never materialized. So she actually got a loan based on fundraising pledge commitments. In other words, people who hadn't put up any money, but people who said they would, which, boy, that's pretty easy to fake. Less than a year after the leading Burlington College Less than a year after leading Burlington College into massive debt, Ms. Sanders resigned, taking with her a $200,000 severance package. By 2014, because of its shaky finances and running deficits, Burlington College found itself placed on probation for two years by the Regional Accreditation Agency. Jane Sanders was president of the college from 2004 to 2011. Her husband, Bernie Sanders, a former mayor of Burlington, served in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1991 to 2007 and since has represented Vermont as in the U.S. Senate. He's now competing with Hillary Clinton for the Democratic presidential nomination. So uh, a strange story, to say the least, but it gets so much stranger. So if you notice there, now, uh, someone did the math on it. There's only 200-something students. And if you look at the tuition, uh, the yearly revenues is, uh, I think it was around $70 million, and then their outlays are around exactly that. So how they're going to service a $10 million loan, no one knows. Uh, but apparently, they were going to get pledges for that. But that's, uh, that's very shady in and of itself. But even more shady than that is the fact that it was the Catholic diocese. Now, at the time when this loan was taken, as one of the commenters points out, uh, they pointed to this story. This story is January 12, 2015, uh, but it goes back to that 2010 deal. Developer adds deal for Burlington College building. And if you scroll down through the story, you can see this little snippet here about the Diocese of Burlington. The building, Farrell, Farrell is this uh, buyer guy who's getting it back at a discount price after the college uh, had to sell it back. The building Farrell is set to buy was built in the 1880s and used by the Roman Catholic Diocese of Burlington as an orphanage for as many as 200 children until 1983. The last inhabitants were Cambodian and Vietnamese refugees, according to documents from the 2010 sale of the building. The building became diocese headquarters in 1978. The diocese in 1996 and later in 1999 settled with at least 74 people who claimed they were abused by diocese staff. Now this is a link 
to the Burlington Free Press. And when you go there, what do you get? You get 404 not found. That's right, it's been scrubbed. But what you can do, of course, is go to the Wayback Machine. And the Wayback Machine will bring you to this article. And this was an article that appeared May 13th in the Burlington Free Press. And uh, this is uh, the story about the sex abuse scandal with the Roman Catholic Diocese of Burlington. In June of 1993, a former Montpelier man said he was sexually and physically abused by a nun in the 50s while in a Burlington orphanage. It sues the Diocese of Burlington. The diocese settled the claim in 96. Settlement amounts are not disclosed. Roman Catholic Diocese of Burlington settles abuse lawsuits for $17.6 million. Now, if you click on this, this one is a dead link as well. But if you search for it, you find this article. And this was also from the Burlington Free Press, and it has been scrubbed. The Roman Catholic Diocese of Burlington today paid $17.6 million dollars to settle 26 lawsuits alleging incidents of long ago child molestation by priests. The settlement expected to be announced in separate news conferences in the next hour by Bishop Salvatore Matano and lawyers for the victims resolves all cases pending against the diocese, including two on appeal before the Vermont Supreme Court. There you go, people. So why was... Bernie Sanders' wife buying $10 million of real estate from the diocese. Well, it happened, both of them happened in 2010, right when the diocese need, needed to pay out $17.6 million in settlement for sex abuse cases. It just so happens that Jane Sanders was there to step up and pledge the money of donors to the college and to uh, fund the court costs and uh, and punitive damages of the Catholic Diocese of Burlington because of their sex abuse. The stories have been scrubbed. This is sick. I, again, I, as I said, I had no, I have no doubt that this was leaked by the Clinton camp. And this is the way it works in politics. Uh, you don't get anywhere unless they have dirt on you. And the big question is whose dirt is going to get spilled? Whose closet is going to get picked through? So you can see right here, we can see that Sanders, uh, they have the dirt on Sanders and uh, it's, it's starting to come out. That's a sick, sick story. Uh, now let's take a look at Burlington. Um, that now apparently the students are going to be able to finish off their studies at other universities. Apparently they're doing some deal here, even though the college is closing, they're going to uh, let them finish out their degrees at, at other universities or something. But uh, this is actually the, a notorious far left uh, organization, this, this Burlington College. And just to show you what a joke our educational system has become. This isn't the bachelor's degree program. This is actually the graduate degrees. These are master's degrees that are offered by Burlington College. Now, I'm not making this up. This isn't a, you know, a comedy routine. This isn't the onion. These are the master's degrees that are offered by Burlington University. And you'll see here, this is why our civilization is finished. So here are the masters. Cinema studies, community-based art and social change, community ecology, creative writing, Cuban studies, digital design and new media, early childhood development, environmental design, expressive arts, Historic Preservation, History, wow, a history degree, amazing. Holistic Ecology, Human Services, Integral Psychology, Integrated Wellness, Literature, Media Activism, Organizational Leadership, Poetry, Political Science, Public Administration and Community, community Development, 
sustainability and development, or design your own individualized major. This is the joke that our universities have become. Nothing but a neo-Marxist, uh, just uh, a joke, pathetic, ridiculous. Uh, but you can see that the, the Sanders team is knee-deep in this mess, uh, not only in this corrupt, socialist, communist, crooked college, but in bankrupting it to help the Catholic diocese pay off their settlements for all of the sexual abuse that they did to young children. Wow, hell is going to be a very populated place. So back to the chart. Uh, it's fascinating that silver is lagging as much as it is while we have First Majestic just exploding to the upside. I, I will give it a 70 to 80 percent chance that uh, I believe that silver is actually going to resolve up uh, and catch First Majestic rather than seeing First Majestic uh, turn around and go down and catch silver. And we'll talk to you next time.